You know, I can never seem to get enough storage. I'm always looking for places to put things. Short term, long term, whatever. And there is no one size fits all with storage, either. That little silverware organizer, well, it's great for forks and spoons, but my bicycle, well, yes, that needs a whole different storage situation. And don't get me started on those holiday decorations. Seriously. (laughs) With programmable logic, the same thing applies. You need some small, fast, local storage elements, and you also need some huge capacity, longer-term memory. To optimize things, you actually need a lot of different shapes, types, and sizes of memory for your design. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk, and guess what? Xilinx has just given us a great new option for memory and their latest devices. It's a big, fast block called Ultra Ram. And hey, let's have Ahab Mosin from Xilinx join us to talk about it right now. Before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out even more information about Xilinx's new Ultra Ram. Hi, Ahab. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Okay, Ahab. Ultra RAM, massive memory. Is this just like it sounds? You basically put a ton of memory on your latest FPGAs and SOCs? Well, a ton of memory is an important takeaway. So, yes, you can think of Ultra RAM as ultra large on chip memory. If your design is sitting in an FPGA, and if you need memory storage, which is typically a necessity in most systems, you're going to want it as close as possible to your digital logic. And designers hate having to go off chip for all the obvious reasons of longer latency, less performance, IO power, cost of the extra memory chips, obviously, and just making it harder to meet overall requirements. Now, UltraRAM tackles the off chip memory problem by letting you replace discrete memories with a brand new on-chip technology. And yet on-chip memory in FPGAs, including Xilinx FPGAs, has been around for a long time, even decades. Why a new technology now? Well, we believe the memory problems hit breaking point. So for generations now, we've been expanding our devices to go way beyond glue logic to one of the most important devices on the board one that can absorb the functionality of DSP, processors, and even analog chips. But memory components take up real space, and they consume real static power. And in fact, solving memory interface I.O. timing closure can be one of the toughest challenges in FPGA design. So we considered all this and evolved our on-chip memory technology to absorb these kind of components. And the benefits can be huge. Well, first of all, on-chip means it's going to be faster, right? Yeah, definitely. Talking to memory on chip is going to be faster than going off chip, obvious. And now you can eliminate the pain of IO design closure between devices, which we just talked about. And part of that includes, by the way, eliminating the need to integrate memory controller IP into the FPGA. And that consumes real digital real estate and has its own implementation challenges. So huge on chip memory tackles all of this. Okay, I think most people can get this. Stay on chip whenever and wherever you can. But speaking of huge, what kind of memory capacity are we really talking about? Okay, let's just break down what we call the memory landscape. So let's look at the memory hierarchy typically available to FPJ designers. So we've had distributed on-chip RAM now for many generations, which uses the logic fabric that you'd really prefer using for the actual design itself. But you can use that fabric as small memory cells to store literally bits or kilobits of data. But more distributed RAM means less fabric for the rest of your design. And that's a trade-off decision you have to make. So later on, we introduced block RAM. And that was dedicated regions of the silicon just for storage. This was a big leap of flexibility. But designers don't stand still either. And even with this, they find themselves constrained in memory resources. Now, the interesting thing is that if you need anything more than tens of megabits, up until now, you'd have to go off chip and you've had to deal with propagation delays through the memory controller, the IOs, the PCB traces, all what we talked about. So you can see from this picture that there's a gap in the hierarchy in terms of memory capacity. A designer will want to do everything possible to stay on chip, but the gap shows the dilemma. You get either fast 
or you get big. What we're trying to say here is that UltraRAM now fills that gap for much more storage and use models. In fact, UltraRAM can give you a total of 360 megabits of on-chip memory. So when you consider in our last generation, there was just over 100 megabits in a big FPGA, 360 is a big deal. Wow, so UltraRAM really blows away those old memory limits. Yeah, that's definitely the idea here. So you've been saying memory replacement, but this kind of begs the question, off-the-shelf memories come in gigabit range, and you're saying 360 megabits. So how does this all add up? Yeah, certainly DRAM can get massive, but there are plenty of memory technologies that are critical to system designs, particularly those applications that need very predictable latency. These technologies include SRAM, RLDRAM, and content addressable memory that are in the tens of megabits range, and which actually are not very cheap. These can be used for things like shallow buffering or for lookup tables. Many of those can definitely come off the board now with UltraRAM. But UltraRAM can be used with even the gigabit level off-chip memories as intermediate caching and to reduce the number of times you have to go off-chip. So it's a fair point. We don't want to give the impression that UltraRAM replaces everything like multi-gigabit DRAM. And whether it be DRAM, SRAM, and so on, you got to figure people are going to have their own ideas of what they want to do with hundreds of megabits of memory. Yeah, absolutely. Whether it be chip replacement or augmenting off-chip memories, the use models are pretty much up to you. So an FPGA designer sees this, and they typically already have something in mind. Okay, Ahab, you say FPGAs, but I know you do SOCs too. Is this an FPGA-only thing? No, no, not at all. UltraRAM is included in all the families in the 60 nanometer Ultrascale Plus portfolio, which includes the Kintex and Vertex FPGA families and the Zinc Multiprocessor SOC or MPSOC. So to answer your question, UltraRAM is not just an FPGA thing, but it's for SOCs too. The same chip replacement story and the use models we've been talking about apply to those who want to design with our Zinc chips. Okay, good to know. So. I understand ultra RAM at a very high level. Pretty straightforward. Big memory, replace chips. Do whatever you want with it. Pretty clear. But what do you have to know if you want to design with these things? Well, architecturally, it has similarities to our existing block RAM, or the embedded memory everyone's familiar with. It's dual ported, and each port is 72 bits wide with error detection on each port and 4 kilobits deep. And note it's a single clock. So it's not asynchronous dual port like block RAM, but it is a whole lot bigger. Each individual block of UltraRAM is eight times the size of traditional block RAM, which is a big deal. One UltraRAM block will be so much faster and more power efficient than stitching eight block RAMs together for the same capacity. But when you do need to stitch UltraRAM together, the connectivity is completely hardened across the length of the device or column. Now that means no additional logic fabric is needed to glue those blocks together. And experienced designers know fabric utilization equals power and performance penalties, which are things they have to think about when stitching block RAM together. Which is not to say block RAM isn't capable of efficient cascading. And in fact, plenty of enhancements were made since the 20 nanometer ultra scale portfolio was released. But UltraRAM is primarily built for this kind of stitching and making big memories for optimal performance and latency and power. Not only is it architecturally built to be more power efficient per bit, but it has intelligent auto power down of blocks where built-in control logic knows which blocks are going to be used in the next several clock cycles. So address look ahead is just as it sounds. It powers down unused blocks depending on where you're about to read or write to, to dramatically reduce static power. Okay, that makes sense. My understanding is on-chip memory can be a real power hog for an FPGA or an ASIC. So if you're going to stack a chip with so much memory, I can see why you'd have to do something about that. Yeah, exactly. RAM can be a big power drain, like you said. And if we're going to scale on-chip memory in a significant way, we have to curb that. And even so, having to go off-chip would be even worse for power. Yeah, more than that. Off-chip certainly has a few things working against it. When you think about it, any kind of read or write has to traverse wherever the source logic is on the chip, work through a memory controller, cross FPGIOs, PCB trace, memory device, and come all the way back, and so on. You can imagine the power consumption and latency there. Now, in contrast, with UltraRAM, you can cascade memories together to meet the capacity of devices like SRAM, 
And with the on-chip advantage, you use the memories when and where you need them, which also means multiple cascades and configuring them differently. So if you want to cascade the writes and keep parallel reads, for example, you can do that. And with a very similar maximum operational frequency of SRAM, assuming a protocol like QDR2, any experienced designer can recognize the performance and power advantages available to them. Okay, so you show an SRAM here, and SRAM can be used for different things. As designers, what kinds of target applications should we have in mind for Ultra RAM? Well, we mentioned things like shallow buffering and caching, but yeah, let's look at an example in, say, wired communications. Say a router line card and a server rack, where you may have, for example, a bridging component that demands relatively shallow packet buffering to store data for short periods, maybe on the order of tens of milliseconds. This kind of use model would traditionally require an external SRAM. Similar types of components would also be needed as lookup tables for packet processing functions and storage for control and state information related to traffic management. Ultra RAM, in such an example, can replace all of these external devices. But I see your big DRAM is still there. Yeah, if you need larger storage that can tolerate longer latencies, then the gigabit class memories make sense. But you can still leverage Ultra RAM here too. Without it, all the packet buffering would have to be done in external DRAM. But with Ultra RAM, the packets can be buffered locally on the chip and sent in bursts to the external memory. Wow, this covers most of the use models you've been talking about. Yeah, it's a pretty comprehensive example. Now, not every application is going to do all these. Such as? Well, let's look at a wireless example, and specifically airborne software-defined radio in military aircraft, which isn't just voice, but also video and data. Now, in our case, the Zinc Ultrascale Plus is the best fit, as it leverages the very sophisticated processing system that you see here on the top of the chip, which we won't focus on here because the integrated FPGA fabric at the bottom of the chip is where the Ultram is located. But when data comes in, the modem works on a more bitstream format before being processed by a forward error correction module that helps control errors against unreliable and noisy channels. But the correction IP typically works on more packetized data. So usually an off-chip SRAM is used to buffer the stream to packetize it. With UltraRAM, rather than a single SRAM, you can have different UltraRAM cascades, one for receive and one for transmit, to improve the performance over a standard SRAM and replace the device altogether. So this is a good case of shallow buffering and device replacement, again. Okay, Ahab. How about an example that doesn't involve SRAM so much, like an application that uses purely gigabit-level DRAM? Yeah, that's a fair point. Let's look at Zinc Ultrascale Plus again in the case of 4K broadcast camera, or ultra-high definition, where again we'll look at the interaction in the programmable logic. And here's where image and video is captured through a MIPI sensor, where a wide range of pretty dynamic processing takes place on the chip. And let's focus on a part of the image processing known as warping where things like bending and a lot of image manipulation takes place. Now throughout all this, there's a lot of DDR memory used for buffering frames while they're being processed. You typically need some kind of cache to prefetch data from the main memory to temporary storage for later use. Now this is pretty key for performance, especially in image processing, because memory access can be such a huge bottleneck. Now block RAM is good, but with the capacity of each block and the cascading limits, you do have limitations. Now with Ultra RAM, because of the cascading, and particularly the size of each block, you can actually fit a significant amount of a frame in a single instance of Ultra RAM. So you're showing here a partial frame, not the whole frame. Yeah, per block. A 4K by 2K image is pretty big, but you can get tens of what are called rasterized lines of an image in a 280 kilobit block of Ultra RAM. A block RAM, in contrast, fits less than one rasterized line in the application. This means a huge performance boost with UltraRAM, limiting the trips you have to make to DRAM, and ultimately getting your final data out faster. Wow, Ahab, this is looking like a big contrast to BlockRAM, which all of a sudden seems kind of, um, old. No, don't think UltraRAM replaces BlockRAM. BlockRAM still lives on. And as an analogy, in the same way you can have a variety of transceiver types on a single device for different use models and protocols and, and line rates, all UltraScale Plus devices have both UltraRAM and BlockRAM. 
And that's just because block RAM is just better at certain things. First, the port widths are configurable and can come down to 36 bits wide, which means for smaller memories, you can use each 36 kilobit block much more efficiently. Second is there are things like built-in FIFO circuitry. This is a common use of block RAM. And because UltraRAM use models are so streamlined to make them performance, area, and power efficient, they don't have this built into them. Now, you can always design your own FIFO around an UltraRAM array, but it's already done for you with block RAM. And third, block RAM is what we call true dual port, in that it has separate clocks for each set of input and output ports. And the obvious advantage here is leveraging a single block RAM for multiple clock domains. So really, the 360 megabit number of ultra RAM we've been talking about hasn't even included the block RAM. When you put it all together, you get up to 360 megabits of ultra RAM and up to 95 megabits of block RAM on a single device. And don't forget the distributed RAM, which can be up to 50 megabits. In the graphic shown, we're displaying our 3D IC architecture with multiple columns of both types of embedded memories. Wow, so the real number of total memory is over 500 megabits? Now you tell me. Well, the raw number is important, but we really wanted to hit home the strengths of each type. So I've kept them separate until now. So while at the end of the day you can use them in any way you want, the architectural differences, while pretty easy to grasp, should be understood before you start designing with either the Ultra RAM or Block RAM in Ultrascale Plus. Well, it's helpful to see how it all fits together. And speaking of all fitting together, your Ultrascale Plus portfolio seems to be your latest and greatest. So can you tell us what else designers can expect in your FPGAs and SOCs? It can't all be about Ultra RAM. Okay, well, Ultra RAM is one of the big ones for sure, but we did introduce a lot of things in Ultra Scale and Ultra Scale Plus, from hardened 100 gigabit cores to the fastest serial line rates in the industry to some of the highest signal processing bandwidth you can get on any chip in the market today. That's a lot of stuff here, and looks like Ultra RAM is just the tip of the iceberg. Well, Ultra RAM is one of the big ones. It definitely stands out as a great device integration story. The opportunity to absorb other chips on board is always something we look for, and UltraRim opens up more doors to that. And Ahab, could you remind us what device families you're talking about? Because not everyone knows what's part of the UltraScale Plus portfolio. Yeah, a reminder would help. You'll find UltraRim across the whole portfolio, including Kintex and Vertex FPGAs, as well as Zinc UltraScale Plus MPSOCs. But they can't all have the same amount of ultra RAM, right? No, of course not. And that's part of the homework for our viewers looking to take the next step. We have plenty of resources on the web, particularly at xilinx.com slash ultra RAM, to help you understand capacity differences by device and family and help you get started. Now, you can find a technology white paper there and a user guide to get you up to speed and access to our power estimator tool to help you approximate the power for your own design using ultra RAM. Well, fantastic. Ahab, that was a lot, and that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out even more information about Xilinx's new Ultra RAM. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to EE Journal's On Demand section or check out EE Journal's YouTube channel, keyword EE Journal.